Let's pray together. Father, God, you tell us that your word is, is living and active and that it cuts through every lie and every untruth in this world and in our own hearts. God, you've given us communication that we might understand who you are and that we might communicate back to you in praise and all of it be to your glory and to your honor and to your name. And God, thank you for allowing us to call you Father. And as we open your word this morning, I pray that you would communicate to our hearts, that you would communicate exactly what we need to hear, that we might glorify and honor you in all things. And we love you, and we pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, it's great to see you this morning, and uh, I trust that you had a, a wonderful worship time. We've had a great week of ministry. We had kids camp this week over in Tampa. And uh, we rejoice that 10 of those young people came to know Christ as their Savior and Lord. Isn't that great? And Barry doing such a great job over there, Barry Edwards. And uh, it was a privilege to, to be there uh, with them for a day. We're going to be talking about some of this morning uh, in our visionary uh, type of series of messages. But next week, let me just say, next week is going to be a very special week. You're not going to want to miss, miss it. We usually ordain our deacons. Um, on Sunday afternoon, Sunday night, we have a little special service out here. We have so many that we're doing this year and ordaining them. We're going to do this on Sunday morning. I'll be preaching a, a special message on leadership and how you can be, not just the, these, these guys, but you can be a better leader wherever you are because all of us lead something. And so we've been talking about that. And then the next week, finishing up the series of messages, we're talking about multiplication, a vision for multiplication. On August 14th, we're going to be starting the new year up here at Cross Life uh, with a uh, big celebration, starting a series of messages on Be Encouraged, God is for You, a five-part series of messages, which uh, I hope you're looking forward to as I am. But let's take our Bible this morning. Let's turn to Isaiah, ch Isaiah chapter 55, um, kind of in the middle of your Bible. <coughs> and uh, as you're turning there, Isaiah chapter 55, we're going to be looking at a visionary call. And what I'm going to be looking at this morning is really, just to put it all on the table, uh, is sharing Christ with others, evangelism. And you may be a little threatened by that because you're thinking to yourself, wow, you know, pastor, we're living in a different day today and we're already afraid to do it. I mean, praise God that somebody shared Jesus with me, but I, you really can't expect me to do that because it's so difficult Anyway, and, and even in this day and age, it's even more difficult to do so. So we're we'll going to be talking about that a little bit, the difficulty of it, because it, it is true that it's not an easy thing to do. Otherwise, everybody would be sharing Christ. But let me just say this. Let me put, put it out for you, and that is this, that Jesus Christ makes the difference in people's lives. Say that with me. Jesus Christ makes the difference in people's lives. Now, let me just back that up for just a moment. Suppose um, the terrorist that killed five Dallas policemen just a few weeks ago. What if, what if somebody would have talked to him about Jesus earlier in life, and then he would have given his heart and life to Christ, become a Christian, born again, however you want to put it. If that would have happened to him, do you think that he would have climbed up in that building and took out his rifle and killed five people and shot seven others? Think about it for just a moment. I don't think that he would, have, he would do that. Let me put it on a more personal level here. Suppose you're going through Atlanta, Georgia, and you don't know your way around. You're just walking through, walking downtown, and uh, you, you just really don't, kind of got lost. Man, you made a wrong turn. And you look through an alley, and you say, oh, that's the, that's the place I need to go. All I have to do is walk through this alley. And so you begin to take off, but you begin then to hear footsteps behind you. And you look around, and you see five guys, we'll say, in spiked hair, already profiling, I know, spiked hair, and leather jackets, okay, and goatees. All right, we'll just say that. And they're behind you. How do you feel right now? Think with me a moment. You're walking through Atlanta. 
you're down a dark alley, you see dumpsters on either side, and five guys with leather jackets, spiked hair, are following you. Would you not feel better if you looked around again and noticed that they were each carrying a Bible in their hand? They just got out of Bible study. They just came from church. I think I'm okay. Why? Because we know even those pe the people that have never trusted Christ as their personal Savior, they know that Jesus Christ really does make a difference. If a person is really, really sincere about their faith, it changes their heart and changes their life. Jesus Christ makes the difference. Now, why is it then, is it so difficult in all the spiritual warfare that we have going on all across the world, including recently in Russia, they outlawed sharing your faith outside the Russian church. And so what is it? Well, I'm going to turn to Isaiah 55 for a reason. I believe I was led here because I preached evangelism and sharing your faith through the New Testament so many times, and you're thinking, what about the Old Testament? I want to show you that evangelism and missions is the very heart of God. It's really at the very root of its nature. All the way back in Isaiah 55, we begin to read, and I want to look at three things this morning. First of all, I want us to look at our mission. Secondly, we, we get to the, the being scared part by looking at our method. And then thirdly, we look at the message itself very, very briefly. Now, let's look at the mission. Look in verse 1 where it says, ho, which simply means I'm going to get your attention here. Everyone who thirsts. Remember what John 4 said about the living water when Jesus was at the the well with the lady, and she says uh, about all these things going on in her life, and he says, I will give you living water. And it, all, it goes on to say, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come, buy and eat. What, what are you eating? The Bible talks about the Word of God being milk to our soul and meat to our, our, our spiritual bodies. He says, come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why is it without cost? because it's prophesying here about a savior who would come and die on the cross for our sins. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and for wages for what does not satisfy? We spend our life on things that are not gonna bring lasting satisfaction in our life, not gonna make a difference in our life, not gonna make a moral difference, not gonna make an eternal difference, not gonna make a, an emotional difference in our life. He says, listen carefully to me and eat what is good and here we find Jesus going to the rich young ruler. And he says, oh, good, um, good master. And he says, why do you call me good? Only God is good. And so what's he talking about here? He's talking about God in the flesh coming. He says, cling to that which is good and delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, which he, according to the faithful mercies shown to David. That's the covenant he made with David, that someone of David's descendants would always sit upon the throne. And of course, that being a spiritual throne of Jesus Christ today. He says, behold, I have made him, talking about David, a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. The idea is here, God's made this everlasting covenant. David was the first witness. Jesus is the witness as he died on the cross for our sins. And now as he's passed the baton of faith over to us, we become those witnesses. Now, what is a witness? A witness in the Old Testament, Hebrew language, just simply a legal term. It was used in all kinds of literature. And it means that you've, you testify of something because of something you've seen, heard, or experienced. Or it could be just the fact that you were at a wedding and you signed as a witness to that wedding. It was a legal term. Now, the Bible says that we are to be witnesses, and all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, it talks about us being that witness for Christ. In fact, Adam, when he sinned against the Lord, was hiding from God. And God said, Adam, where are you? He was searching for those already that were lost. Matthew, it says in, in the Gospel of Matthew, go everywhere. In Mark, at 16, it says, go with me. In Luke 24, go together. In the Gospel of John, go as, I, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. 
In Acts 1.8, it says, go with power. It talks about this power in Romans 1.16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the very power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Here we find in the Bible a theme running through it. And that is that God has a heart and his very nature, the core of his nature, to reach people for salvation for himself, to rescue those that are perishing. Then, there's a, this, along with this theme, there's a theme of us whose lives have been changed by the power of God to be those witnesses. And the idea here is a sentness, a sentness. I have been sent out with a purpose. I've been sent out into the world as a witness for a purpose of leading people to the Lord. Now, you look at this and say, yeah, but it's so tough today. It's so hard. It's so different than any other day in America that we've ever lived in. And you are absolutely right. And that's why we need to look at the method. Peter Drucker, who's a management guru of my generation, uh, has written many, many management books. In fact, he's, he's really the, the guy, the expert, tells a story about going into a bank way back in his younger days. And in this bank, he was filling out a loan application, and the banker asked him where he went to church. Well, he thought that was an odd question, but he answered. And he says, okay, would your pastor or someone on that staff give you a letter of recommendation for this loan? And he said, what? What does that have to do with my loan? And the banker looked at him and said, well, you don't think we would give a loan to a non-Christian, do you? I mean, we want our money paid back. And so the only way we give loans is people that go to church and people who are recommended by somebody on that staff. He was, he was amazed. Now, I want to ask, I'm, this, is, this is the premise I'm setting out. Things are different today. Now, I want to ask you a question. I want you to contemplate it. It's deep, okay? Deep question, and here it is. How many of you have been to the bank in the last 10 years and tried to apply for a loan where the banker said, you're going to have to go and talk to Dwayne Mercer and get a recommendation to get this loan or a pastor like him, somebody on staff? How many of you would say that you have been asked to do that? Well, just like in the first service, just like in the other service over in the East Campus, nobody. Why? Because things really have changed today. In the old days, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and hanging on a little bit in the 80s, but not much, there was a, a conversion of people because you were, you were converting people from a Christian consciousness over to a Christian commitment. Nowadays, that's not true. Now, let me, let me put it in this way. If if you look at a scale between 1 and 10, 1 and 10, and you were to ask, okay, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and I know it's digressing, uh, going uh, less and less, but in the 60s, in 70s was, I mean, my goodness, that was the Jesus movement. And so what about it? I mean, where were people standing that day? 1 to 10 scale. With 10 being receiving Christ and 1 not knowing the gospel, at, does it, doesn't even know it. Can't tell you what it is. People were basically sitting on Seven, eight, nine. I can remember sharing Christ in those days, and I know we had to pull out the apologetics and Josh McDowell stuff and all that, but basically it was convincing people that this was true. They went from a Christian consciousness, understanding the Bible, the Bible, understanding basically what it all meant, understanding what it meant to go to church, what the church really taught, so where are we today? Well, I think if we be honest with ourselves, most people are at one, two, three. I, I sit with people on planes today and understand after I talk to them, they have no clue. Of what, they think they know what Christianity is about, and that's why they don't want it. But they don't know what Christianity is all about. And so, in fact, they're, they're more involved in, um, in expressive individualism. It's called today in the Western society, Western civilization. In other words, excessive, I mean, expressive individual, individualism means truth comes from within me. 
Not from without, not, not from a book, not from a religion, not from things happening, but rather how I interpret things that happen. What I see, hear, experience, and how I interpret those things, that's true for me. And therefore, we've got such a long, it seems like a long way to go to bring them to the 10 spot. Now, let me say this. <clears throat> Salvation, I don't want you to misunderstand me. Salvation is a point in time experience. The Bible says, Jesus said, you must be born again. So it's comparing salvation to being birthed. And there's a point in time where you were born, the doctor will fill out the paper, oh, it's this such and such a date at this such and such a time. Why? Because there's a point in time. It also compares us to being married. Well, there's a point in time in which you stand before the pastor or you stand before the justice of the peace and you say, I will, I do, a point in time. But in spite of the fact that salvation is a point in time experience, evangelism is a process. Evangelizing is a process. And you start off by, by you know, even, in a, even in an engagement, for example, a wedding, you start off by getting, you meet one another, you get to know one another, you build it up, build it up, boom, and there's a time that you get married, and then you grow together after that. You, your birth, well, you're in your mother's womb for nine months, then your birth, and then you grow for the rest of the time. So there is spiritual growth involved, but it comes after the salvation experience. And so when we look at this, we understand there, there are really stages to the, the evangelism process. And it is a conversion process. Somebody says, well, I don't think you ought to convert people. Well, let me just say this. You're trying to convert me. If you're saying that we should not convert people, and that's your conviction, and when you say that to me, you're trying to convince me to believe like you believe and not convert anybody. Okay, that's, everybody is a con conversionist that has strong feelings, strong conviction, and talks, okay? So what, is, what are the stages? First of all, I got these from several really different people over the years, but the first one is awareness. Tim Keller brings this out, an awareness. That is what Christianity is all about. Some people feel like Christianity is just a political movement. Mo many, many people are sitting on the one, two, or three, they feel like it's just a political movement. Man, if, if you do this, you vote this way. That's what it's all about. It's a stronghold uh, political movement. So they, they have different things, or it's a judgmental thing. Oh, they're living this, such a righteous life, and they're judging everybody else. They have no clue. They don't really know what it is, but there's an awareness of what Christianity is all about. When I was 12 years old, I became aware of the gospel. I was six years old. I can remember going to church. I can remember listening to the Sunday school lessons. I'm sure they shared the plan of salvation many, many times. But the problem was I already thought I knew how to please God. I already thought I knew how to get to heaven. And that is just live a good life. And my, I was good. My parents told me I was good. My mommy told me so. So I know that I was a good boy. So I had nothing to worry about. In fact, when the pastor that taught our Sunday school class that Sunday when I was 12 years old, when he shared with us, it's all about the grace of God, Jesus Christ dying on the cross. You have to do nothing. Jesus Christ has done it all. Just receive his free gift. I thought he was a heretic. I went home and asked my parents about it. There was an awareness there, but not an understanding. So there's an awareness of the gospel. Secondly, there's a connection. That's when, okay, it suddenly makes sense to you. I think that happened to me when I was watching a, a film the King of Kings on television about the life of Christ. When he's dying on the cross, he rose again on the third day. Though suddenly it began to speak to me why I could not save myself. Then there's the truth. There's that truth time that I went through from the age of about 14 to 16 to ask myself the question, is this really true? And without that step, you're probably not going to follow through with anything. You're just going to pray a prayer and that's all it's going to be. And then fourthly, there's a receiving of it a receiving of the gospel. And some people even try it out first. They do. I did. You know, you think, well, what would I do if I, now, if I were a Christian 
this is what I'd do. Now, I did that. Was I really satisfied with that? I mean, I know it doesn't make any sense, but I did that. Many people do that. And the only way that will benefit you is that you think to yourself, well, I'm going to read the Bible since a Christian would read the Bible. I'm going to read it and see how I feel about it. That will help you. Otherwise, trying it out is not going to work because the Holy Spirit of God comes to live inside of your heart and life when you make the commitment to Christ, and it changes your desires and changes uh, who you are in many, many ways immediately. And so as we look at this, we understand it's difficult for me to go to someone, say, sitting on an airplane who doesn't know me, and I'm talking to them about God, and then I talk to them about Jesus Christ, and I explain the gospel to them. Not that I don't want to do that. I do want to do that. But so often I do that knowing they're not going to make a decision right then. Not like it used to be. I'm just planting a seed. Why? Because really, in order to reach most people, we need a church. We need a family reaching those people. They didn't get into the mess they're in by themselves, and they're not going to get out by themselves. We need a church that is an evangelistic church. Now, what are some of the characteristics of that? Number one, a friendliness. You're, you're just going to be helpful. People equate this to loving them. I remember a couple that I was visiting with, and eventually they, um, within a few weeks, they, they prayed to receive Christ. They were baptized, joined the church. But when I visited them, they said, you know, we visited this church over here, and uh, we just didn't like it. We thought they were a bunch of hypocrites. Ooh, really, why? I mean, I knew the church. I didn't know that much about it. And, but um, I said, why? why would you say that? I said, well, they didn't speak to us. Now, think about that for just one. They just didn't speak to you? You see, people that don't know the Lord, they don't understand things. They're sitting way back here, even on five, four, five, and six. They think to themselves, okay, if I were going to imagine a church, a loving church, I would imagine that loving church being friendly with me. People said, then why don't you do the greeting and fellas shaking hands every Sunday? Well, because we've read article after article, including Tom Rainer, who is Mr. Surveyor these days. And we've come to find out that one of the number one things what people hate, not just the visitors, but even members hate, is the greeting and fellowship time. Why? Because it's not genuine most of the time. I hate to say it, maybe, maybe it is here. I pray that it is. But in all the churches that I visited over the last 10 years, eight, 10 years, I only know of one, First Baptist Church of Hiawassee, Georgia, that was genuinely friendly during that time. Otherwise, I have, to, I have to, you know, turn around and wait for people to get through talking to their friends to greet them. And I have to be the aggressor in every single church I visited. As a visitor, I had to be the aggressive one to say hello to someone. And so people just think it's not genuine. A genuinely loving church is going to be a friendly church. But I got to move on. What about your, our speech? Can you imagine Never going to a church. I, I met someone not too long ago that hadn't been in church in 40 years. I've met people before that don't even know what the hymnal is. Now, you don't either because we don't have them. But nevertheless, in the old days, I mean, they, they didn't turn in your Bibles. They, they didn't know anything about the Bible. Nothing. There's probably people here today that, that sort of feel that, that lostness in all the speech. You know, we talk about, and I'm not good at it either. I'm, I'm working on it. All the speech that we have that's not necessarily biblical speech. It's just in-house, behind-the-scenes speech, you know. God's going to really bless that, you know. Oh, yeah, God's all over that. You know, we're going to have a revival. And, uh, you know, oh, just, let's, let's just plead the blood over that. <laughs> Do you talk that way at work? I mean, here you are sitting around and thinking what you're going to do for the day and maybe a, a boardroom or whatever. And somebody says, well, this is the project we're going to do. What do you think about that? And you speak up and say, yeah, I, I think God's all over that one. Man, the Holy Spirit's going to really anoint that project. And somebody else says, yeah, I, I don't know about this. We, we need to plead the blood over this project. You don't talk that way. You talk normal even when you talk about spiritual things. You're aware that the people around you do not understand your lingo. So the speech needs to be the same here. We need to have, thirdly, quality of ministry. People say, well, I've read articles before. Well, why don't you just have ministry and let people minister and let, you know, hey, look, I, I grew up in a small church. I pastored small churches. And, um, 
And I've been in, I've visited, I've been in revivals. Oh, man, back in my early days, I preached revival in all the small churches, it seems like, around my, my area, Athens, Georgia, Tacoa, Georgia. And you, in small churches, you can do this. You can say, Aunt Susie has requested that her granddaughter sing a song. And the granddaughter gets up, and you know how it goes. And by the way, when somebody stands up in one of those churches and says, says to you, you know, don't listen to me singing, just listen to the words of this song, you can bet it's not going to be good. I mean, get out the earplugs, folks, you know, and it, <clears throat> unless you're tone deaf. And so, uh, you know, but everybody loves this young girl. Why? Because they know her. But the visitors in that small church are thinking, wow, poor Aunt Susie, man, she has a no ear. She's tone deaf completely. And it's a misery thing for the next three or four or five minutes. Or, or the pastor getting up and sharing the same testimony he's, he's shared for the, for the last 23 years and has nothing from the Word of God. You know? And you think, well, yeah, but we just love the pastor, man. He visited us in the hospital and he's done funerals. We just, but you know, there's a lot of people that just don't know me. They don't. They don't know the rest of the staff around here. There needs to be a sense of excellence. But fourthly, there needs to be a connection of the gospel to the worldview. Now, let me share with you something that's going to help you in your witness. And in, in my day, in fact, my, my father's day, there was a man by the name of Billy Graham. Anybody ever heard of him at all? All right, many of you, you know, wouldn't, you wouldn't vote for nothing if you had to. You think I'm going to call on you. But anyway, I'm not going to do that, by the way. But Billy Graham, all of, his, all of his sermons centered around a theme, and that is you're not good enough, only Christ is good enough, and he had to, he had to die on the cross for your sins. You know, that's what you heard. Why? Because that spoke to the people there. They were concerned about being good enough to get to heaven. Well, there was a day in there in the early 90s and 2000s where Rick Warren really hit the nail on the head with a purpose-driven life because the theme, more of my generation, the one just younger than me, is about purpose. You've got to have a purpose in life. So many messages to that generation needs to fit the connection, hey, God has a purpose for your life. The younger generation is freedom. And that's why you hear me say things like, the only one, <clears throat> because, I mean, you give your life to something all the time. Nobody's really free. Nobody. And the only person that you can give your life to that will not come back to haunt you is Jesus Christ. So you speak to freedom. But lastly, this is the most important one for each one of us here. We need to build relationships with the primary purpose of leading people to Jesus Christ. Now, I know what some of you are going to think immediately. Now, Pastor, wait a minute. That seems like you're a project instead of a friend. It seems like what you're saying is we need, we need to purposely go out, make friends just to lead them to our way of argument. No, I'm saying, you know, you're not arguing anything. You're giving them something that's very precious. Now, let me, let me put it in this way. Um, suppose you had cancer. My wife is a cancer survivor, so I'm very sensitive to that, by the way. But you have cancer, and you found the cure for cancer, and it's a potion. If you take this potion, you're going to be healed of cancer. So you take the potion because you've been taught this is a good thing. So you take it, you're healed. Now, you go out, and you tell someone else, someone you don't know. You meet someone at an airport, on a plane, and, uh, you know, or maybe at school, and you say, oh, you've got cancer. Listen, if you take this, this potion right here, then, then you're going to be healed. And they look at you and say, I've never heard of any potion like that. I'm not, I'm not going to, I mean, that's, may make, <laughs> that could make me a drug addict, you know. It could be, you know, I've heard about people that take this potion. Man, they, they have to vote Republican all the time, you know. <laughs> I've heard about people like that, man. They have to go to church all the time. Man, I don't, I don't know if I want anything like that. They don't know. So, no, 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 no. I've taken this. It'll cure you. And they say, I don't know you. Now, how are they going to make that bridge? No, you get to know them. You build not only a rapport, but kind of a, really a friendship with them. You open up. You, you ask them things. You, you ask, let them talk. You help them in their projects in life. And then you say, well, look, I want you to take this potion. And they look at you and they say, well... 
You've taken the potion and it, it, you're not a nut. You're, you're not crazy. And I like you and I trust you. Okay, let me drink the potion. See, but they're just a project. Listen to me very carefully. The man, the young, the young man is dying. Well, I don't want to make him a project. I'm going to let him die of cancer. You would never do that. The young man is, the young lady is dying. So, of course, you're going to do everything you can to give them the potion. Let me remind you, Jesus Christ makes the difference in this life, and he makes the difference in heaven and hell. The Bible says, who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. These things have I written to you that you may know that you have eternal life. They're, they're dying. They're dying. They're lost. They're, they're, your friend is lost. The guy you don't know that is not your friend yet is lost. Of course I want to give them the answer. Even if it means them coming back to me. And believe me, nobody has ever come back to me and said, oh, now wait a minute, was I just a project? No, they're just rejoicing that I love them enough to share Jesus Christ with them. And will he make the sacrifices involved? Do you have friends like that? Somebody says, well, you know, I don't even have any lost friends. The point is, you go out and find those friends. Can you, can you say two? Two friends, people you know, but they're not your friend and they need Jesus. Could you take the time to invest in them because of your love for the Lord and love for them, to invest in their life so they will you will earn an audience with them because they don't know. They're sitting on one, two, or three. They have, a, a, they have a concept of you and of Christianity and of this church that is just unrealistic and not true. But they have that in their mind, and their truth comes from what's inside of them, and you've got to show them differently. So what does your friend need to do? What does your friend need to know? Let's look at the message very quickly. I've looked in the first three verses. It says, an everlasting covenant. This word means to cut, to make, to cut. And the idea was that in the Old Testament, that God would take, or a man would take an animal and divide it in half and put it on each side, and the two people that were making the covenant would walk through the dead animals. And it was a sign to them saying, if I break my promise may what happened to these animals happen to me. God says, I've cut a covenant with you. And he's the only one that walked through it. And so he's saying, look, I'm making you a promise, a covenant that I will never break. And it comes through David and it will come through Jesus Christ. So what does your friend need to know? Well, in 1 Corinthians 15, I've got it up on your screen. Um, it says this. Paul says, for I delivered to you a first importance. Right there. Say that with me. First importance. Say it again. Say it again. Now, how do I know this is important? It's first importance. And so he's saying, look, nothing else is more important in the Bible than what I'm about to tell you. And there's two things your lost friend, your friend that does not know the Lord, needs to know. Number one. It says, Jesus died for our sins, according to the Scripture. Then he gives the evidence of it. Notice he gives two things that they need to know, and then two evidences, an evidence each of those things. He was buried. How do we know he died? Man, he was buried. He was wrapped up in 140 pounds worth of ointment and, and cloth and put in a grave for three days. We, he was dead. He was pronounced dead by uh, two Roman executioners. He was dead. We know that. Why did he die? I mean, this was God in the flesh. Why did he have to die? It says, for our sins. God demonstrated his love, the Bible says, in that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. What does our friend need to know? Our friend needs to know that Jesus Christ died for his sins. Then he's going to have to understand what that sin is. Because he's not convinced most of the time that, that he sinned. After all, there's no, he thinks there's no freedom in that, so... I've done wrong things, but I'm not really a sinner. Sin is anything that you do wrong anytime you do something that you shouldn't do, and then anytime you do something 
that you've thought about. Maybe you didn't even do it. You just thought about it too long. Boy, there's just a myriad of things I'm guilty of. A myriad of things. What about you? He said, sure. In fact, being a Christian makes your life so much better, but you still don't get all that out of your life until you get to heaven. You just kind of let God work on it. The Bible says Jesus Christ died, according to the Scriptures. Then it says he was buried and he rose again. That's the second thing they need to know. He rose again from the dead, and it was proved that he saw with Cephas, that's Peter, and the 12, the 12 apostles. Then he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. He's saying, look, some of them are dead, but most of them are still alive, even as I'm claiming this. Boy, how important is that? Hey, look, I'm, I'm claiming something that many of you right there at the church of Corinth know is true because you've seen him with your own eyes. Wow. What does your friend need to know? That Jesus Christ died on the cross for their sins. He arose on the third day to conquer death, to conquer sin for them, that all they have to do is what? Come. That's what it says here back in Isaiah 55. Come, verse 1. Come, again in verse 1. Just come. Come and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no cost to you. Believe the cost has already been paid. And with that price, what do you do? What do you do when you call on him? What do you do when you come, rather? Three things that happen, real quickly. First of all, you, you call on him. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It says in verse 6, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. The second thing is repentance of sin. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have compassion on him. A repentance, it means I'm the boss of my own life. I'm going one way. I'm the boss of my own life. Now I'm turning and repenting and going the other way. I'm following Jesus as Lord. And it says the result of it is God's going to have compassion on us. And he will abundantly pardon, pardon of sin, a total pardon. You know, our friends are like a person going out on a lake and swimming. And they decide to take this morning swim. And if you do it, say, in North Georgia, there's a fog in the mountains that happens almost every, seems like every morning. Probably doesn't, but it just seems like it. And so you're out there on the lake and you're swimming and suddenly you think, I need to go back. And you sort of come to yourself and think, wow, look at all the fog. Where did it come from? What's all this? And you're thinking, I have no idea which way to go. I'm, I'm really lost out here. And you, you say, I, I can't panic. I don't need to panic. So you, I think it's this way. You start swimming. Then you start getting in doubt, and you swim another way, and then another way, and you think you begin to panic, and then suddenly somebody from the shore begins to call out to you. And they, they're calling your name because they know that you're missing, and they think you're out on the lake. And you yell back at them, just keep calling, just keep calling. And you follow the voice. Your friends are looking for a voice, a voice. I remember when Art Nodecker was a member here, I got a chance to go in with two other people into his home and lead he and Patty to the Lord. They've since moved back to Pennsylvania. But they then told me, they invited a couple of family, family members to the church, and uh, we had a chance to lead them to Christ in their home. And uh, they were, uh, they're still here, as a matter of fact. But then Art goes home to Pennsylvania, and he begins to, to share Christ with his whole family. And one Sunday night, I, I remember one Sunday night, right over here in Legacy Hall, uh, during one of our Sunday night services, he invited all his relatives that he had led to the Lord. And there was about a dozen people up on stage that he had led to Christ that were willing to come all the way from Pennsylvania just to celebrate with him. You see, what he did, what happened to him can happen to you. It can. So I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you today to learn how to share your faith. We're going to offer a course in the fall. Just stay tuned. But also commit today to say, I'm going to take, remember, think about two people that maybe you're not, my, maybe they are my friends, maybe they're not at this point. But I'm going to purposely 
Befriend them. Pray for them. Walk before them as Christ would walk, best I can. And I'm going to invest myself in them so I can win a voice in their life that I can give them the cross of Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ. With heads bowed and eyes closed this morning, maybe you're sitting here this morning and you're thinking to yourself, wow, you know, I'm, I'm one of those people that I'm not sitting on one, two, or three anymore. I'm sitting on maybe the five, six, seven, and maybe, maybe even higher. And I've come here, I've just been inquisitive about the gospel. I just didn't know. And now I know. There's an awareness there that I need Jesus. There's a connection there that has touched my heart. And I know it's true. And now the time has come for you to receive him. And if that's the prayer of your heart, I want to ask you to pray this prayer with me silently as I pray aloud as you call on the Lord. Pray with me now. Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for going to the cross and dying for my sins. I open up the door of my heart and ask you to come in. I pray that you would forgive me. I pray that you'd help me to follow you from here on out as I worship you today for saving me. In Jesus' name.